we'll start by thanking you all for coming and being part of this webinar. This came out of, uh, I think, an opportunity to try and find opportunities to make the best of what's a very challenging situation. But we also at Mustakis recognize that sometimes we put together presentations, one of us does that, goes off and delivers that presentation, maybe to a very small specific audience, and it might be of interest to a, a larger audience. So we decided to kind of combine those, those two things into the Mustakis Monday webinars. And for the foreseeable future, we're gonna be delivering one of these webinars every Monday. Uh, we'll continue doing that unless we see that there's like one registrant and it's my wife every single time. And if that's the case, then we'll, we'll, we'll dim it down. But hopefully we'll get interest in, in all of these, these presentations. So um, I think to, to get started, I'll just dive right into this first one, the parable of the blind men in the Institute. I had a little fun with the title here, or just what is the Mustakis Institute? So in the Mustakis office, I do get uh, a little bit teased sometimes about uh, bringing up this parable, but I think that it's, it's really applicable to the Mustakis Institute. For anyone who doesn't know this parable, it's the idea that a number of blind men come forward to try and, and identify what this thing is when they approach an elephant and describe it to other people. And depending on how they interact with it, they describe it in a different way. If they touch the tail, they say it's a rope. If they touch the, the tusk, they say it's a spear. And so they all have a different perspective based on how they interacted with the elephant. That's the same thing that happens with Mustakis. And I was actually struck by that when I was looking at the people who are registering, and there were a number of names that were not familiar to me. And again, that's because they've interacted with Mustakis through other people. So this whole presentation is kind of aimed at that, that audience who, yes, I know Mustakis, but I may only know Mustakis in, in a certain way. So what I'm going to do is give you an overview of the Mustakis Institute, the, the basics, our general approach, the tools we use, the staff members that, that we have, and just how you could engage with Mustakis, how we engage with other people. And then I'll go into a little more detail about each one of our six conservation research themes and give you a little detail about what that theme is in general, and then a couple of project examples, just a couple. There are a number of projects under each one of those research themes, and you can get all of those through our, our website. Um, at the very end here is a, a partner list. No, it's not just to brag that we have a lot of partners. It's to try and show the the type and the variety of partners that we work with. I'm not gonna go through it in detail and name every single person because I guarantee I have missed somebody and I don't want anyone to be offended. But it's just for anybody who hasn't worked with Mustakis a lot to get a sense of, oh, those are the kinds of people that the Mustakis Institute works with. And also note that in this presentation, if anybody is interested in having it at the end, you'll see my email, fire me an email and I'll send you a smaller, lower resolution, more email digestible PDF version of the presentation that you can have afterwards. So to get started, this is, this is the slide that you would see in any presentation, but it's really kind of what the whole presentation is about. The Mustakis Institute is a not-for-profit organization. We're also a registered charity. And we're an applied research institute and we have an affiliation with Mount Royal University in, in Calgary and we're based at Mount Royal University in Calgary. So our, our vision statement, our goal is a world where communities have genuine access to the science and research they need to make choices that promote healthy landscapes. And the work that we do, our, our mission statement is to make that innovative research accessible to communities and decision makers. And I really want to zero in on, on the phrase decision makers because we use that term extremely broadly. So it is everybody from federal government, provincial government, municipal government, other NGOs, industry players, individual landowners, anyone who is making a decision that has an impact or the potential to impact the ecological health of the landscapes of, of, our, of our province, of our country, of our world. So just to start off, the Mustakis Institute's general approach, I polled everybody in the office when I put this together to say, if you were to say one thing about the Mustakis Institute to try and describe to people what, what the elephant was, what would that be? And so these are the things that came out. Focus on real world conservation issues that decision makers are currently facing or that they are imminently facing. So to try and be extremely practical, extremely pragmatic about those kinds of decisions to get input and buy-in from that decision maker at the start. It's not always possible, but to the degree possible, we really try and work with them to design the project in the first place so that it can be much more easily slid into their, their decision-making process at the end. We collaborate a lot. Um, I did a, a calculation 
rough calculation that showed an average of, of eight partners per project. That's kind of skewed because sometimes it's one partner, sometimes it's 22 partners. I would say the median is probably around three partners per project. But the point is we, we collaborate a lot on our projects. Again, those first two points probably indicate why. The next one is that we're, we're science-based. And so that means sometimes we're doing primary research, sometimes we're doing secondary research, a lot of, in fact, the majority of what we do is probably around the knowledge transfer, whether we've done that primary, secondary, or, or not, is to get that information again into the hands of, of decision makers. And then the last point I'll make I think is important is that we recognize that we are a small organization. We recognize we can't do everything. So what can we do? We try and within the areas that we focus on, identify where are the gaps. Is there a particular piece of knowledge or understanding? Does a policy need to be created, reviewed, or better understood? Or is there a group that needs to be engaged? Is there a particular technology that could help fill that gap within an entire process or a longer string of things that are happening? So we try and identify those. Our structure, like I said, we're affiliated with Mount Royal University. We have a, a relatively small team, six people. And we do all of our, our work through projects. We're entirely project funded, meaning we don't have a core funder that funds the organization. So we do everything through a, a project fund. Um, our revenues are a mix of, of grants and fee for service or contract. Uh, we have some donations, not a, a lot of donations. The vast majority of our revenues are, are those two. If I were to guess at any given point, it's maybe a 50-50 split between those, but obviously that varies. We have a mix of projects that we initiate where we identify the issue, create the project and go out and, and make that happen. And sometimes projects that people bring to us and say, hey, can you help us out? We're trying to figure this thing out and we think you can be of assistance to us. And again, if I were to guess, I'd say it's probably a two thirds, third split. So two thirds projects that we initiate and a third projects where people are coming to us. And then everything that we do is focused on our, our six or comes under our six research themes, our conservation research themes. And like I said, I'm going to go through all of those in, in a fair amount of detail. It's kind of the, the main meat of the presentation that I'm doing today. So the tools we use, and some of these things you may not think of as tools, but I, I think of them as tools because these are the, the pieces that we may create in the process of doing one of these projects, of trying to solve one of these dilemmas. And so it might be reports, um, GIS analyses, smartphone apps and technology. We facilitate and host a number of workshops, a number of symposia. We've created numerous web tools. Sometimes we're creating how-to guides. Sometimes we're doing an analysis of policy or creating policy briefs. We do a lot of work with remote cameras. We uh, contribute to or create academic papers and we engage community. Again, community in a, a very broad sense in a number of ways. So um, working with them directly, um, working on projects that help bring them into other kinds of initiatives. So everything that we do is, is using the tools that seem most appropriate to try and, and get the job done. We're not married to any one of these. Just wanna emphasize the, the reports one at the top. Last year we had 38,000 downloads of our reports and we were kind of surprised by that number. It was actually kind of funny because uh, Dana Duke, our executive director, was not sure that was an accurate number and, and made uh, our web programmer, Ken Sanderson, Ken Sanderson, go through it all again and uh, come up with the numbers again. And we really wanted to be sure that this actually was an accurate number and it wasn't just our friends from Russia who were downloading it. And yes, it, it is in fact a, an accurate number. So we were really pleased to see that in terms of the impact that we hope that we're having. So our staff, like I said, it's a small team. There are six of us. We're all based in Calgary, except for Ken, who's based in Prince Edward Island. And there's a variety of expertises and experiences across all of those six that relate to the different research themes that we work on. And so when we look at a project, we're mixing the research theme and the skill sets that we have within the staff. You can contact any one of the, the staff members. We all use the same nomenclature protocol for our email addresses. It's our first name at rockies.ca. So if you want to talk to any one of us about any of the projects or about the organization in general, that's the best way to get hold of us, especially right now. We will not be answering our phone number. So the research themes, like I said, this is kind of the meat of, of what I wanted to talk about. And what I'm going to do for each one of them is just describe the what and why of each research theme, each of the six, and give you a picture just in general. And then 
do a couple of, of project examples that are either current or very recent to give you a, a sense of the kind of work that we might do under each one of those. So the first one I'll start with is private land conservation. So the why and the what, it's a, a recognition that a lot of the land that's really important for wildlife habitat or water cycling or nutrient cycling, all of those ecological proce processes is privately held. These are private lands across the landscape. Land trusts and municipalities and others are working really hard to ensure that those parcels continue to play those important roles. And what we try and do at Mustakis is support the private land conservation community, which I think it's important to note is includes the landowners. We work a lot with landowners directly. And that's providing, again, research services, tools, resources, planning, management, policy assistance, whatever it might be that helps with that entire process. So to give you a couple of examples. The first one here, private land conservation and the pathway to target one. Pathway to Canada target one is Canada's effort to respond to the international call to conserve 17% of our terrestrial lands and inland waters. And one of the challenges that we have is that privately conserved lands don't really easily fit into that system. And so Mustakis has been working for a while with a number of partners, and in this case with the Canadian Land Trust Working Group, to create an alignment guide for them so that they could use that to take any parcel that they conserve and run it through that, not from the perspective of a protected area, which is where all of the other alignment guides start, but from the perspective of the tools that they use, fee simple purchase, conservation easements, and see whether they align with the Pathway to Canada target one or not. Another example is a conservation easement web resource. This is something that is online. It's at ce-alberta.ca. It's something that we created with the Environmental Law Center and was funded by the government of Alberta. And it's basically the, the nuts and bolts of conservation easements in Alberta. And it's split into the basic questions and the advanced questions. So 101 and 201, everything from what is this thing to if I were to try and draft a conservation easement with multiple purposes, what might be a template that I would use? So it really tries to cover that entire range. Another program area that we've worked on for a while is transfer of development credits. It's a tool that allows you to identify areas within your municipality that are appropriate for conservation and areas that are more appropriate for development. And then identify credits for the conservation areas that can be transferred into the development areas, increasing the development there and maintaining the conservation in the, the conservation areas. That's a really simple description of a complex tool, but what we tried to do to try and answer that question in a little more detail is create this website, the Practical Guide to Transfer Development Credits in Alberta. And again, that's tdc-alberta.ca. And why I don't have those websites listed on the slide, I don't know, but maybe in, in version 2.0 I will. The next one is citizen science for conservation. So the why and the what. We really believe that the stronger sustainable solutions are those ones that engage citizens in better understanding the issue, contributing their personal knowledge and experience and being involved in the implementation. So everything from using their capacity to the democratization of science. So Mustakis uses the citizen science approach to generate information for specific conservation challenges, create knowledgeable citizenry, or get that citizenry engaged, it's a hard word to say, citizenry engaged in those, those different initiatives. And so there's a number of different things that Mustakis has done over the years in developing tools and frameworks that help to contribute to, to more successful citizen science projects that we undertake or that others undertake. So a couple of examples, Call of the Wetland is a big one that we've been working on for many years in the city of Calgary, working with the city of Calgary and using a smartphone app that helps citizens when they go and as volunteers um, are assigned different wetlands that they can go and, and um, see the, the amphibian activity within those wetlands. They gather that information, they enter that information into the smartphone app, goes into a central database, and that database can be used by the City of Calgary in their work for wetland planning, for conservation planning, and a number of other initiatives. Collision count is one that we've worked on in southeastern, excuse me, southwestern Alberta, down in the Crow's Nest Pass in an area where a number of wildlife mitigation efforts have been put in place to help wildlife move across Highway 3. And again, using the technology of smartphone app, using the capacity of the people within the, the Crow's Nest Pass, they can use that app, gather that information, and that information then is used to create a data set that is used by all of our partners in that area, including the Transportation Agency, Alberta Transportation, Alberta Environment and Parks, the local community, the land trust community, and uh, the conservation and um, academic 
entities that are in the, the Crow's Nest Pass or working in the Crow's Nest Pass. Another one that's more broad is the using citizen science to advance environmental monitoring in Alberta. And this one is more at a policy level. It's recognizing that citizen science is growing as a tool being used within a number of governments, including the government of Alberta, and that there is a need for policy and protocols that help people see more credibility, have more faith in the way that it can be used, and understand the way that they can use citizen science approaches. And so what Mustakis has been doing is working with the government of Alberta to develop those, those um, protocols and that policy within the government of Alberta. The next theme is human wildlife coexistence. Again, the why and the what. Human developments of, of all types, so housing, agriculture, industry, recreation, they all infringe on wildlife habitat and wildlife movement. And we know that the efforts around wildlife management are attempting to balance the needs of wildlife and the needs of people. And to do that, you need the best available science. So what Mustakis tries to do is examine ways to improve the coexistence of humans and wildlife in a number of different ways by determining wildlife needs, assessing human impacts, and exploring adaptive management approaches for uh, humans, adaptive management approaches focused on wildlife, and getting all of that information again into the hands of the decision makers who are, are focused in these areas. So a couple of examples. Path to Coexistence, a wildlife and ag workshop, one that we did in partnership with the Alberta beef producers. And the idea here was to bring together a number of people who were involved in the different proposals that were coming forward on how to reconcile land use by agricultural producers and by wildlife and bring them all into a single workshop to talk not about a particular solution, but to talk about what are the things that we don't know and that we would need to know to assess any or implement any possible solution that comes forward. Another one is Calgary Captured, where we have cameras all through the city of Calgary in areas where wildlife are known to use the area, capturing the types of activity, the types of wildlife, and where and how they're using those areas. This is done in partnership with the city of Calgary, and again, that information is used by the city of Calgary in their management efforts across the, the city. And I always kind of chuckle when I look at this slide because the fact that there are black bears and grizzly bears and cougars in the city doesn't seem to generate as much consternation as the fact that there are raccoons in the city. And when I tell that too, seems to panic about that more so. Putting beavers to work. This is a, a, a quite a large scale project that we've been working on for a while with our partners at Cows and Fish. There's a number of different aspects to this project, including knowledge transfer and information through a number of web sources, creation of specific tools and specific uh, fact sheets that provide information directly on certain topics. We've hosted symposia and even getting out with municipalities and doing workshops on how you actually use some of these mitigative devices to help people and beavers better coexist. So the next theme is transportation ecology. And again, the, <clears throat> the why and the what. Transportation infrastructure, we know it poses a number of challenges environmentally for air, landscapes, water, and in particular roads and railways cause a lot of challenges for wildlife in terms of direct mortality, but also as a barrier to movement across the, the roads and railways. So what we try and do is work to generate a couple of things like awareness of those challenges, to awareness of what might be workable solutions, and then to work on some of those solutions and then generate support for implementing those solutions. Again, working with a number of different partners in transportation agencies, environment agencies, academia. So first example I'll talk about is Pronghorn Crossing in the southeast of Alberta and actually it's part of a, uh, an extension of a number of projects that relates all the way through into the United States and the idea is looking at where Pronghorn are crossing the, the roads and again using technology and using people in the area to gather that information and submit that information to create a database working with projects like the Alberta Conservation Association uh, partners like the Alberta Conservation Association we can get that information, get that information into databases that can be used by academics to do modeling, by transportation agencies to do mitigation. This was an interesting one. The owners of the Mount Norquay Ski Hill, directly across from the town of Banff in, in Banff National Park, approached us to essentially ask a fairly simple, uh, simple question with a complex answer. If you were to put in a gondola going up to the ski hill, 
as opposed to the current access by a road, would there be a potential to have a positive, a net gain for wildlife in terms of movement through that area? And so they asked us to facilitate that process. And what we did was a number of pieces, everything from gathering the experts in the area, including the experts we have in house, a number of modeling exercises or six different models that were created, brand new models using existing data, and then a structured mechanism to gather expert opinion on different aspects of, of wildlife movement and of management options to, to answer that question. And the, the punchline for that one is that, yes, it is possible for there to be an environmental gain in terms of wildlife movement if there is a gondola in place there. But of course, the devil is in the details. There are a number of things that need to be done by uh, management agencies in conjunction with that. So improving wildlife safety along Alberta's highway network is an effort to kind of scale this up. So a number of projects that we worked on focused in specific areas, but this one was to attempt to try and look at the entire network of highways across Alberta, work again with the transportation agencies and the environment agencies in Alberta. And this process was again, a structured expert review process to bring in all of the people who are working in this area, take them through one of these processes to quantify expert opinion and help identify where are the priority areas and the priority issues around wildlife mitigation for, for crossing on Alberta's highway network. This next theme, conservation policy and planning, is a bit of a, a cross theme theme because, of course, a number of the things that I've mentioned to you already have policy and planning components, but we have one where we recognize that sometimes we just need to dig right into the, the policy. So that speaks to the why and the what. It's, it's this recognition that success in environmental conservation really relies on being proactive. So that means the development of plans, the development of, of policy, improvements in the policy process, working in advance proactively with the, the relevant players. So what we try and do at Mustakis is provide support for conservation planning, a variety of different types of planning, as you can see listed there, and conservation policy making, land use policy, fiscal policy, conservation policy, science policy, that whole realm of, of policy areas, and to try and again provide support for the entities that are working within those areas and help improve that, that policy dynamic. So first example is an, a project where we looked at using PLUSES and PNTs for conservation. Lots of, of P acronyms there. PLUS is public land use zone and PNTs is protective notations. And these are two types of, of land use categorizations that are used for public lands within the provincial government that are often brought forward by the conservation community to suggest that they could be used for nature conservation. And sometimes they can, sometimes they can't. What we tried to do was identify where are the opportunities, where are the limitations of using those kinds of policy tools to try and advance nature conservation, ecological conservation in Alberta. Another one was in 2016, 2016 to 2017, the Alberta government completely revamped the Municipal Government Act. And one of the most significant things was they added a new purpose for, for uh, municipalities. And that new purpose was to foster the well-being of the environment. There wasn't a lot of support behind that. So we worked with our partners at the Environmental Law Center to create this document called Interpreting Alberta Municipalities' New Purpose. And the idea was to try and identify what this might mean, what kinds of policy support that might need, and what the implications for uh, implementation for municipalities might be. Some of you may be aware that in 2017, the, uh, um, I think it was 2017, Waterton Lakes National Park experienced a, a very significant wildfire, the Kino wildfire. It burned more than 50% of the vegetation in the park and of that uh, area that was burned, 70% uh, of it was at a very high intensity. So the entire environmental monitoring and environmental management process within Waterton Lakes National Park literally changed overnight. And what this would mean became an open question so Waterton Lakes National Park approached us and asked us if we would facilitate a workshop for them to explore exactly this, bring in the experts on these areas and help them gather the information they need to revamp their new approach to environmental management, ecological management within the park. The next theme, municipalities and conservation, starts with the, the, the why and what, starts with the, this, I think, not some... Um, uh, not too dramatic statement that conservation is inextricably linked to land use and municipalities are the front lines of land use decision making. And I think we've come to see that more and more over time. So 
The municipal land use decisions, therefore, can have a really disproportionate ability to affect ecological systems, both positively and negatively. And so Mastakis has worked with urban and rural municipalities to help them develop information, tools, uh, research, anything that can help them support more sustainable municipal land use decisions. And this research theme is focused around that. Some of the examples include the Working with Nature Toolkit that we just finished. This is a toolkit aimed at small and medium-sized municipalities to help them go through a process of, of identifying their, their natural infrastructure assets, their goals and their, their desires around those assets, hazards and risks, and then develop a set of prioritized actions around what they would do to try and maximize their maintenance of those assets and the benefits from those assets and then integrate that as seamlessly as possible into their existing policy development. And that whole toolkit is available on our website. It essentially is based on a number of workbook aspects, worksheets through an Excel spreadsheet environment, and then workshops where we gather people in the room and go through the process of identifying the assets and working them through each piece of this. And we were really fortunate to be able to partner with the town of Cochrane in developing this. So we had a, a good real world pilot in the, the process and get some, some support funding from uh, the Watershed Resilience and Restoration Program of the Government of Alberta. The next one that we're working on right now with um, support from Alberta Innovate's uh, Water Innovation Project is a municipal wetlands data strategy for the Bow Basin. It's a recognition that there is wetlands data out there. Municipalities have access to it, but municipalities use it in a variety of different ways, a variety of different data sets, and very few of them, if any, are really well suited to the kinds of municipal planning decision making that, that happens at that level. So this pro project is in process, but we just recently had a workshop with, I believe it was 12 different municipalities in the basin to talk about what are the issues, what are the needs, what data is currently available and start the steps of plotting a, a strategy forward of how they can get more accurate, more consistent use of, of wetlands data. This is a really neat project, the Least Conflict Lands for Renewable Energy, and it comes from this recognition that we all need to push for more renewable energy, but we also have to recognize that there can be an ecological impact from that, especially at the industrial scale. And municipalities in particular are really challenged with how they incorporate all of those considerations in their decision making. So the Least Conflict Lands for Renewable Energy tool is a decision support tool that we were able to pilot with uh, Wheatland County and the County of Newell that helps them identify through a number of different uh, activities and then create map-based products from those activities, where are the areas that will generate the least conflict? There's always gonna be some conflict, but where are the areas that would generate the least conflict from an ecological perspective, from a societal perspective, from a built development perspective? So now I've got a really long list of partners and, and um, like I said, uh, it's not just to, to brag about all of our partners, but to point out that we do have a number of partners that we work with and a, a real variety of partners that we work with. And like I said, this, this PowerPoint will be available for anybody who wants to have it afterwards. And you can see that whole list. The point is, if you don't see yourself on there, uh, we, we'd like to see you on there. So if you have questions about some of the things that we've been doing and it looks like you're the kind of partner that would fit into that list, please, please get in touch with us. So after I put this slide on, I was chuckling to myself because it starts with our phone number. Please don't call our phone number. We're not there. Um, the message will just tell you to try and get in touch with one of us. We're currently all working from home as part of our, our COVID adaptation process. Um, but you can get in touch with any one of us using our first name and at rockies.ca. And so um, my email is guy at rockies.ca. Um, <clears throat> and I think that reminds me that I did not introduce myself at the beginning of the presentation and even have a note for myself to do that. Clearly, I don't follow my own notes. My name is Guy Greenaway. I'm a senior project manager at the Mustakas Institute. If you want to get a hold of me and ask me why I failed to introduce myself at the beginning of a webinar, you can contact me at guy at rockies.ca. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys now. We've got lots of time for questions if you have um, questions. Like I said, the chat box is, is there, um, depending on the interface that you use and the operating system you use, it might be in a slightly different place, but um, it will be one of your options to open up the chat box. You can type your message. I will um, see your message as, as a question and I can respond to any questions that anybody has. Um, but it also, if you have questions later and you just want to contact uh, later, or if you know a particular person within Mastakis you want to contact, you certainly can do that as well. 
And I will just um, also mention again, we'll be doing webinars like this. Um, this one is very general about Mystacus. The upcoming webinars will be um, much more um, uh, much more specific to particular things, uh, particular projects that we worked on, particular issues that we might consider important. But um, we'll be sending those out on Thursdays to the newsletter list. If you're signed up on the newsletter, you'll get those automatically. And there'll be a link in there to tell you how to connect to the, the webinar. And we'll continue to use Zoom webinar. So employing my best scientific technique I'm assuming that there's no questions or everybody's gone. Okay, question. Um, I quite appreciate you guys setting this up. It makes me feel less lonely and it was surprising what I did not know. Yeah, you know, um, we've been trying to find ways to, to connect and keep conservation moving in these, these really, really challenging times. And, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to keep doing things like this because I have to say there's sometimes when a presentation goes out by one of my colleagues, I kind of wish that I was in the audience to hear exactly what they're doing. Thanks, Dave. Yes, um, I figured that not everybody knows the entire elephant. I'm glad to hear that there's some things that you weren't, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that this helped you know of some things that you weren't aware of. I think we'll work better to try and make you aware of them. Um, one of the questions um, up front was, I'm wondering where the name Mystacus comes from. Um, the, the Mystacus Institute was originally created to uh, focus on, actually focus on data collection in the area of the Rocky Mountains shared by Alberta, BC and Montana. And we're still actually incorporated internationally to work on that area and do a lot of work in that area. But that spine of the Rockies, um, the Pakani word for that spine of the Rockies is Mystacus. And, or some variation of Mystacus. There, there tends to be fairly um, universal agreement that um, the pronunciation is wrong, but there is no agreement on exactly what the right pronunciation is. So we say Mystacus. Okay, thanks, Karen. So she'll definitely look some of the pro products and publications up. Like they are all on our website and they're organized by research theme or you can go directly to the resource library and some of the final reports are, are located there as well. So everything that we do is there. And I should say also everything that we do, we make available uh, for free and um, without uh, restriction. So if you see a tool that you want to use, you can use that tool. Um, if you see um, something that uh, you would like to apply in your area, we make those things available for everybody. Uh, let's see, next question is, uh, any thought about using the tool of conservation easement to protect prime agricultural land? Um, I believe that Kim Good is on the, one of the, uh, the people on here, um, but um, <clears throat> conservation easements ever since 2009 have been able, have had the ability to be used on agricultural land. That's not the case in all provinces by any means, but we haven't yet been using it for agricultural land. Now, I'll, I'll put that, a caveat on that. The prime purpose, it's stated in these conservation easement agreements since the, the mid 1990s has been environmental ecological conservation, but in many cases they were written to protect agricultural land as long as there was that nexus of environmental and agricultural importance. Um, Kim Good and a number of people are, are working with her to develop a, an agricultural land trust focused primarily on agricultural land, but there are a number of land trusts that have agricultural land protection as one of their goals, including the Legacy Land, um, <clears throat> uh, the Legacy land Trust Society, um, Western, land, Western Sky Land Trust, um, Southern Alberta Land Trust Society, a number of land trusts have that as one of their purposes, so everybody is trying to figure out exactly how to do that. Uh, who would I talk to from Mystacus to find out what data is typically collected for an environmental study for proposed new developments in Alberta rural municipalities? That's an interesting question. You know, I, I would suggest you contact me directly because that's a very complex question. Um, <clears throat> for the most part, it's, it's very, very different depending on what it is, what aspect of the environment is being investigated and what the municipality has chosen to look at. That overlaps with what, munis or sorry, what provincial requirements there are as well. But again, there's some, some discrepancies there. So that's um, a really good question and a really long answer. So Flora, if you can contact me, I can answer that. 
Um, from Emily, how closely does Mustakis work with other organizations that have some overlap with their work, such as ABMI, for example? Um, we, we work with a, a lot of organizations with overlap with us. Um, again, good question. In fact, I don't think, because we have, have those six research themes, you, you certainly can't point to any one of those and say, oh, Mustakis is the only one who does something there. Um, obviously, there are a number of groups working in there. So everything that we do, we start off by trying to figure out who else is working in that space. Um, can we work collaborative, collaboratively with those people in that space? Is there something different that we're um, identifying that is similar to them? And at the very least, making sure that they're aware. So for example, ABMI has been doing a number of citizen science projects, um, uh, some technology um, projects. Um, uh, acoustic monitoring projects and Mustakis has been in touch with ABMI on, on all of those. Um, Karen Sunquist, yes to the ag easements. I'm working on some policy work off the side of my desk. It's just hard to get traction now. Um, I had connected with Kim as well as she and others have initiated the, the ag land trust. Um, I would also direct you to, um, <clears throat> yes, definitely talk to Kim and, and keep on that. Um, I would also direct you to um, our website. We do have a policy paper that we put together uh, when Kim was at Mustakis and we worked with the Environmental Law Center to look at the um, agricultural conservation easements and what that could look like in, in Alberta. So you can find that project under the private land conservation theme on our website and uh, that report, I think it would be very, uh, a very interesting read for you. Okay, I think the questions are, are petering out. Um, I want to thank you all very much for um, for participating. As Brendan pointed out, it makes us all feel a little less lonely when um, we feel like we can connect with our conservation colleagues. So I very much appreciate your participation and hopefully you'll take in some of the upcoming webinars as well. So unless there are any other questions, I just want to say thank you all for participating. <laughs>